Jordan sits in his high school classroom, inspecting the birds fly by the window. He gazes, seeing the wind blow against the leaves on the ground. Just then, he's snapped out of his trance by Miss Leonard, his history teacher. She snarls at him. Jordan, do you care to answer the question? May 6th, 1937. That's when the Hindenburg disaster happened. The teacher gasps in surprise. Very good. I'm astonished you're still passing this course with how much you daydream. She moves back to the chalkboard, leaving Jordan alone. He gazes at the classroom clock, observing the time. 2 o'clock p.m. He still has an hour of class to go. Sighing, Jordan takes out his phone to text his friends Matt and Jeff in their group chat. The group has its usual conversations. Girls, video games, and unnecessary photos they found funny. He was about to put away his phone before he received a text message from Jeff. Jordan, me and Matt have been thinking about exploring the abandoned asylum. We think there may be ghosts there. Chuckling, Jordan types. Man, you guys know there ain't no such thing as ghost. Jeff quickly replies with another text. True. But what if there's something valuable to sell, or something spooky in the asylum? Before he can send another text, Jordan hears a thump on his desk. Looking upwards, he notices Miss Leonard with her hand out. Knowing what the gesture means, he gives her his phone. With a look of disappointment on her face, she lectures Jordan. Jordan, you should know there is no texting in my classroom. You'll get your phone back at the end of the week. And while you're at it, visit the principal's office. I'm sure you will love to hear what you've been doing in my class. Without hesitation, Jordan picks up his book and pencils, putting them into his backpack. Heading to the exit of the class, he gives a goodbye wave to Miss Leonard's classroom. He goes straight to the school's front door, calling it an early day. Exiting the school, Jordan gets out his spare phone, due to the teacher holding his phone hostage. He holds a spare one for these occasions. A buzz emanates from his phone. Another text, this time from Matt. Hey bro, Jeff and I have some major plans. Call me when you can. Jordan rolls his eyes, thinking of what silly thing his friends have planned for him this time. Last month they played Ding Dong Ditch and were nearly arrested when a police officer caught them in the act. Smiling at the memory, Jordan dials Matt's number just like the message said. A person on the other line answers. In a friendly tone, a man answers on the other line. This is Matt, how can I help you? Jordan replies in an amused tone. I would like one explanation on a call given by you. Of course. Jeff and I are going to the asylum tonight. We're going to search for some copper. I know a great guy who'll give us a fair sum of money for any stuff we find. A voice of doubt casts over Jordan. You sure you want to do this? The last time we pulled one of your plans, we almost got arrested. Matt's voice comes over the phone in a carefree jingle. That was just bad luck, my friend. Jordan puts the phone closer to his ear. His whole attention was now on Matt. Sure, Matt, why not? And who knows? There's probably ghosts there. Okay, enough about ghosts. Where and when do you want to meet? Westgate, 10 o'clock p.m. That's where we'll meet. Thanks, bro. I'll talk to you later. Hanging up his phone, Jordan opens the front door to his house. His cat goes up to him, pointing to its food bowl. Jordan knows what it wants. He goes to the pantry, grabbing the cat's food to fill up the cat's food bowl. Jordan strokes his cat's ear, snickering to himself. You got it easy, Charlie. You don't have school, work, or any chores. You get to sleep all day while I spend a long, boring seven hours at school. Flopping onto the couch, he puts down the cat, staring at the clock on the wall, watching the time slowly go by. He figures he'll play Xbox until the time to meet his friends come, but before Jordan knows it, he is fast asleep. Matt yells in disappointment. Damn it! I almost had it! Jeff sets down the controller, stretching his arms. 
Nah, bro. It looks like you're going to have to try another day. <laughs> you still can't beat me in Call of Duty. Matt rolls his eyes. <sighs> Whatever, Jeff. Get your ass in the kitchen and get some noodles ready. Jeff removes his gaming headphones and walks to the kitchen. Opening the cupboard, he grabs a bag of noodles and starts to cook them. Sticking his head out to the kitchen, Jeff looks at Matt, asking him about the asylum. Hey, Matt, uh, do you think it's going to be safe to go to the asylum tonight? Matt looks back, answering with confidence. The asylum's been locked for over 40 years now. It's got to have some valuable stuff in it, and who knows, it may even be full of ghosts. Matt points at the clock, reading 5.37 p.m. Let's be honest, does 10 o'clock sound like a good time? Jeff replies in a muddled tone. Why? What's the problem? It'll be cold out, and I don't want to be out too late. Jeff rolls his eyes, disappointed in his friend's answer. Fine, we'll do it your way. Let's make it 8.30. Matt takes his phone, texting Jordan about the time change. After, the two pick up their controllers, ready for their rematch on Call of Duty. Jordan hears the alarm clock from his phone blasting from his pocket. Waking up, he takes a look at the screen. It's 7.45 p.m. He was more tired than he thought. His nap lasts about 30 minutes, not a couple of hours. He sits upright, letting out a tiring yawn, brushing the sleep away from his eyes. Cracking his joints, he gets off the couch, seeing an unread message on his phone. Grabbing it, he sees a message from Matt. Jordan, there's been a change of plans. We're meeting at 8.30 now. Putting the phone down, he walks to his dresser, tossing a pair of new clothes onto the floor. His house wasn't far from the old asylum, so he was in no rush to get ready. He put on a gray hoodie and blue jeans before exiting the bedroom and going to the fridge to grab a granola bar. With a mouthful of food, he feels his phone vibrate. Another text message. We're off to the asylum now. We'll see you there. The clock on his phone reads 8.10 p.m. Quickly, he runs down the stairs, exiting the house. Locking the door behind him, Jordan jogs down the steps, enjoying the crisp spring night. Cold weather with no wind. A perfect day to break into an asylum. There was no going back now. Matt stands there, outside the asylum, his hands in his pockets, shivering. Ugh. Come on, where the hell is he? Jeff stares back at Matt. Quit shivering, you pussy. You're the one who wanted to come early. I just didn't want him to beat us here. Light footsteps approach from the bushes in the distance. Matt, in a defensive stance, points his flashlight towards the bushes, revealing Jordan. He shields his eyes, signaling for him to put down the flashlight. Stunned, Matt gives Jordan a handshake. To be honest, I'm surprised you even came. You usually don't do these things. Jordan replies, chuckling. You know me. I've got those balls of steel. Jeff interrupts, placing his arms around Matt and Jordan. As much as I love this reunion, we should probably get inside before someone sees us. The three agree, making their way to the asylum. Along the way, Jeff explains the plan. A couple of days ago, Matt and I scouted the building out. We found a locked entrance on the west side. He takes out a pair of bolt cutters from his backpack. We're going to break the lock, go inside, and look for anything worth taking. Easy peasy. Jordan raises his eyebrow with sarcasm in his voice. Great plan you got there. Don't you think that's going to create, you know, some noise? Jeff dismisses the question. Trust me, bro. I know what I'm doing. The three go to the locked door. Jeff takes the bolt cutter, breaking the padlock. A powerful echo comes from the lock as it hits the ground. Jordan and Matt immediately look at Jeff in an unfriendly kind of look. Jeff gives them the middle finger as he opens the door.
A rush of rotten dust and rotten smell hit their faces as they enter the dark, lifeless building. The room's darkness now removed the light from the moon-illuminated sky. They take out their flashlights, studying the room in front of them. Red living paint fills the walls. Mold and cracks were visible on the walls, creating a misty smell, making them cover their noses. Jordan lets out a wheezing cough. <coughs> Jesus, what died in here? Matt and Jeff stay silent, nearly gagging at the smell of the room. The three shine their flashlights on all corners of the room. To the left of them was a brown staircase with steps looking to collapse at any moment. There is an empty hall to the right, with doors leading the rooms. Jordan gives Matt a slight shove. I thought there would be stuff in here, not some broken building. No one has been in this building for over 40 years. What did you expect? A welcoming party? Jeff shushes the two, pointing to a ledge above them. There's got to be something up there. Let's take the stairs, but be careful. I don't want to carry any of you out with a broken leg. Jordan takes the lead, moving up the stairs before stopping on the final step. Matt bumps into him, nearly tripping. Annoyingly, Matt whispers, What the fuck are you doing? Jordan's eyes widened. His body was frozen in terror at the sight in front of him. Quietly, he whispers, Guys, look at this. The three of them flash their lights on a white wall filled with portraits of people in chairs. Each photo has a man or woman in a tortured position with gruesome details done to them. Jeff lets out a fearful whimper. Guys, what the fuck is this? Jordan and Matt shake their heads in disbelief, their faces bewildered at the portraits. One portrait shows a man bound to a chair, with restraints holding his wrists and feet in place. Clothespins keep his eyes open, as the man sweats, frozen, laughing. Jeff, breaking the silence, takes the portrait and throws it over the stairs to the grounds below them. A loud thud of glass and shattered wood fills the room below them. Jordan lets out a voice of fear and skepticism. Calm down, Jeff. It's probably some fake photos, made to keep people away. Matt shudders in response. Well, it's working. Come on, let's go downstairs. I don't want to be up here any longer than we have to be. The three agree, and make their way down the stairs, going back to the entrance. They look at the empty hall and descend it. A feeling of relaxation comes from the group as the walls contain no portraits. Matt speaks out loud. So what did you think of the portrait, Jordan? Jordan throws up his hands in shock. I don't want to talk about it. Let's just find copper. The faster we get some, the faster we can get out of here. Matt turns to the left to face Jeff, but he's not there. Not seeing him, Matt tugs on Jordan's collar with force. Wide-eyed. He screams. Jordan, where's Jeff? Jordan ignores the question, yelling through the building. Jeff, I don't know what sick joke you're playing. Cut it out. I want to get out of here now. The only response they get is the wind's sound outside, but a small ray of light catches their attention. The two exit the hall and approach the light. The light turns out to be a small lamp on a wooden table in the middle of the room. On the table is a written note with Jeff's flashlight beside it. The two look at each other with bewildered expressions, walking to the note, picking it up. Matt picks it up, reading it out loud. Hello. I see you two have entered my home uninvited. I don't know the reason for your arrival, but you've made a terrible choice coming here. Your friend is with me. He has broken one of my portraits, so now he must be the replacement. Throwing the note across the floor, Matt pulls out his phone to call 911, but there is no signal. Jordan and Matt search for the door they entered from, but can't find it. Jordan looks back at Matt with a look of desperation and a quivering voice. This has got to be some sort of prank, right? Abruptly. 
Matt's phone rings. He reaches into his pocket, tearing out the phone, nearly dropping it in the process. The display of the caller ID reads, Jeffrey. Matt gently presses the talk button. Tears come from his face as he whispers, Jeff, where are you? A slow, riddled voice comes from the other line. Who said I want to leave? The voice is Jeff's, except the words are scratched and sound like static. Frustration takes over as Jordan hangs up the phone. He tries to call 911 again, but the signal is gone. They return to the hallway, peering into every room as they sprint down the corridor. Each room is empty, with no contents inside. After examining the final room, the two grasp their knees, taking heavy breaths before a loud shriek gets their attention. Jumping to their feet, the two shine their flashlights to the location of the scream. At the end of the hall is a grey-looking figure. They can only see its back, but they make out some details. The figure's skin is grey, and its spine is crooked and squiggly. Its arms are twisted, almost like a badly drawn cartoon character. The figure turns to face Matt and Jeff, revealing two dark, circular eyes with no nose. A black liquid spews from its open mouth. The figure gradually walks towards the two. The two boys scream in terror. The figure hisses at them. Why would you guys leave? It's wonderful here. Quickly, the two run down the hall, turning to the nearest room, closing and locking the door behind them. Hearing the loud footsteps of the figure behind them, they lean against the door before the figure charges at it. The two try to hold their weight against the door, but the force from the figure knocks the two boys to the ground. It keeps charging at the door, nearly breaking it with every hit. The hinges on the door and lock were about to give out. Abruptly, the figure stops its attack releasing a high-pitched scream. Wouldn't he become one with us? You'll love it here. Matt collapses to the ground, rocking back and forth, his hands to his head, repeating to himself. We're going to die. We're going to die. We're going to die here. Jordan kneels to Matt, placing his hands on his shoulders, reassuring him. Listen to me. You're not going to die. There is only one of those things and there are two of us. Matt puts Jordan's hands off of him, pointing to the door. Are you kidding me, Jordan? We can't take that thing on. Jordan extends his hand out, bringing Matt to his feet. Before the two can do anything, they hear a knock at the now nearly destroyed door. The figure hisses out loud. You're looking for your friend, correct? It's easy. The answer is behind you. Jordan investigates the room, spotting a table with a blanket over it. He removes the blanket from the table, revealing Jeff. His eyes are gouged out from their socket. His nose is cut to the bone. The only thing inside his mouth is empty gum and blood. Jordan pukes on the ground, losing his balance momentarily, and cries. Matt stands in shock whimpering to himself. It's Jeff. He's dead. Jeff's dead. Jordan grabs Matt's shoulders, looking him in the eye. We need to move now. Matt nods, wiping the tears from his eyes. The two walk to the door, looking underneath it, not seeing any signs of the figure. They open the door to find themselves in a new hallway not matching the one before. The hall smells of death and rotting flesh. Abruptly, a loud crash is heard from behind them. The two look back to see the door covered by a wall. On the wall is a message written in some black liquid. Jordan interprets it out loud, terror-stricken. Since I'm in a good mood, I'll let one of you live and one of you die. There are two halls. There is one to the left and one to the right. Choose wisely, as only one of you can go down a hall. One leads to your salvation. The other leads to eternal torment by my hands. 
Pushing Jordan to the ground, Matt runs to the left hallway, ready to test his fate. Jordan cries out in terror, watching his friend slowly disappear from his sight. No, wait. He starts to go after Matt before he stops himself, remembering the instructions. Only one person can go down a hallway. Hesitantly, he takes the right hallway to test his fate as well. Quietness fills the air except for the tiny droplets of water coming from the nearly collapsed roof. On the walls are hung portraits of people in chairs, just like the ones they saw in the upper staircase. Jordan freezes at the sight of one of the portraits. In the portrait is Matt. He has a giant smile on his face, with his eyes cut open. His face is beaten, his arms and legs tied to a chair, and blood spews from his mouth. Slowly, Jordan looks away from the portrait ready to accept his fate before a visible light down the hall gets his attention. He turns his flashlight, shining it in the direction of the light. It is a window boarded up by wood, revealing the night sky above. Above it are the words, Jump to your salvation. Not knowing if it's a trick, he starts to step away, but stops, hearing Matt's screams come from the hallway behind him. The idea of saving his friend is gone when he sees what is running towards him. Figures of Jeff and Matt slowly approach him, black liquid spewing from their mouths. Without thinking, Jordan runs to the window. Behind him, he hears the footsteps of two figures gaining on him. He feels the fingertip of one of the figures brushing his hair before he breaks through the window. Landing on his side, he feels his arm pop out of the socket. Quickly, he takes the flashlight and points it to the broken window to see the figures beckoning at him. This doesn't stop him, as he runs with fear in his veins all the way home. At his house, Jordan opens the door, slamming it shut. He runs to the phone and calls 911. A woman picks up. 911, what's your emergency? I need help. My friends are in Meadowbrook Asylum. Please help them. Please, slow down. Are your friends still inside the building? I, I didn't go to the asylum. It, it was my friends. They told me they wanted to explore it, but I said no. Have you tried to contact them? Lady, shut up. Just send an officer to the asylum. Hanging up the phone, he tosses it halfway across the room. Taking off his shirt, he notices the bone in his arm is bent. Sharp pains come from his shoulder. With the adrenaline now gone and the added pain from his injuries, he passes out. Jordan slowly opens his eyes, waking up on the couch. It's morning. For a moment, he thinks it was all a dream. But the pain in his left arm comes rushing back, reminding him of the asylum, the portraits, and his friends. An Amber Alerts on his blinking phone confirms everything that happened the night before was real. Last night, two people disappeared in the Brazen area, Jeffrey Higgins and Matthew Richardson. If you have any information regarding turning off the alert, Jordan knows they won't find them. On the left side of his phone reads an unread message from Matt. With trembling hands, he opens the message, revealing its contents. On the message are three portraits. The first and second portraits show Matt and Jeff bound to a chair with looks of fear on their faces. The third portrait is in a white room with an empty chair with five words written over it. You belong to us now. <laughs> Jordan hides behind the bed. His breathing grows silent as the figure enters the room. It lets out a slight hiss. In a playful tone, it asks, Jordan, where are you? We want you to join us. Holding his trembling hands to his mouth, Jordan stays quiet. The feelings of fear and panic flood his body as he moves to the other corner of the room. You're here somewhere. He takes a deep breath. A new feeling of bravery crawled over, 
He is tired of being the mouse instead of the cat. Jordan takes action. He slowly crawls to the other side of the room, picking up a piece of shattered glass. Peeking around the corner, he sees the figure near his previous hiding spot. Using the element of surprise, he creeps behind the figure, stabbing it in the side multiple times. The figure falls to the ground, flailing and screeching in pain. Taking advantage of the situation, he runs from the room into an empty hall. The walls display scratch marks and rolls of graffiti. The air is freezing. This hasn't been a room he has seen in the asylum before. Dismissing the confusion and conditions, he knew he had to focus on the one thing that mattered. Staying alive. Between deep breaths, Jordan runs across the foyer, reaching a dead end in the hallway. A high-pitched shriek follows in his direction as the figure approaches him, black liquid spilling from its stomach where the glass lays. Jordan spots a lead pipe on the floor. He grips until his hands turn white, ready to fight. The figure casually strolls towards him, its arms straight together, and its grey, cracked legs drag across the floor. The figure stops eight feet from Jordan as it unrolls its hand, extending its bony-like fingers, pointing to something behind him. It laughs maniacally. It's time for you to join them. Behind him is a portrait. The portrait reveals a tall, slender man wearing a face mask and a white lab coat holding a knife to Jordan's throat. The man's eyes covered in black. Dismissing the portrait, Jordan looks back at the figure to see the man in front of him. He is lifted off the ground by the man. His cold hands grip Jordan's throat, making him struggle to breathe. As the man's grip tightens, so does the life from Jordan's body. The man lets out a whisper, staring into Jordan's dying eyes. Jordan bolts upright from bed, breathing violently. He cradles in it assuring himself everything is okay. The same dream has repeated itself ever since the asylum's journey. Jordan follows his morning routine. He gets out of bed, gets dressed, and adjusts the cast on his left arm, the one he nearly shattered jumping through the window. At last, ready for the day, he opens the door to see his father in front, startling him. Oh, Dad, you scared me. His father looks at him, concerned. Noticing the shaken condition of his son, he asks, Jordan, are you okay? You look like a mess. Jordan takes a sigh, fixing his hair. Yeah, just another nightmare. Are you still struggling with Matt and Jeff? Irritated by his father's question, he cultivates his voice. Yes, Dad. They were my best friends. Jordan's dad attempts to assure him. <sighs> son, I know how you feel. I've lost friends in the past. Jordan attempts to exit the room, but his dad blocks the exits, looking at his son. Listen, I, I didn't come to check on you. I came to tell you the police want to see you. Again? Jordan's dad points his finger to the stair. Yes, again. Now go, Jordan. She's in the kitchen. I don't want to repeat it. Jordan descends to the kitchen at a slow pace, seeing a female officer sitting at the kitchen table with a cup of coffee. The officer has her red hair in a bun with brown eyes. She wears a firmly pressed ironed uniform with a shiny badge, reading, Officer Price. A little intimidated by the unexpected visitor, he walks to the table, taking a seat across from her. The officer looks up, noticing Jordan. In an enthusiastic tone, she offers her hand. Jordan Myers, it's nice to meet you. I'm Officer Ashley Price. Not seeing any reaction from him, she lowers her hands down, allowing him to speak. What do you guys want to ask me now? I keep telling you the same story, but you keep coming back. Officer Price nods her head. Yes, I've heard your story, but I think there's more to it. As you know, I'm following up on the disappearance of Jeffrey Higgins and Matthew Richardson. I'd like to hear your story again. Clenching his fists, Jordan tells the story he has made up. Jeff called me, saying he was going to the asylum with Matt. They never told me why or when. 
They invited me to come, but I never went with them. She stares at him in a stern tone, stating, Look, kid, I know there's something you're not telling me. Just because we couldn't find their phones or them inside the asylum doesn't mean you're telling me everything. Matching Jordan's gaze, she replies, Well, the officers and I looked at their phone records to see who they contacted before they disappeared, and the records show they called you. The question I have is, why did you call 911 an hour and a half after they told you they were leaving? Something made you do that. Denying the officer's statement, Jordan rises from his seat, his voice now defensive. Nothing like that happened. Jeff said to me in the call he would talk to me in about an hour. After that, an hour passed, I called you guys because it wasn't like him to miss calls. I may have overreacted, but I was right, wasn't I? She raises an eyebrow at Jordan replying to him in an expressive tone. Kid, we're talking about two teenagers who have gone missing, not some breaking and entering charge. I need the truth. <sighs> I was at the asylum with them. I can't tell you what happened when the three of us were there. You wouldn't believe me. All I can say is go to the asylum and find the portraits. Just look for the portraits along the walls. You'll see them. His voice becomes frantic. It'll explain everything. You'll see things that you never thought existed. They're in the portraits. They're in the portraits. A look of bewilderment crosses his face with a look of disgust. His heart drops, knowing she didn't believe him. I know it sounds crazy, but what I saw can't be explained. You gotta believe me. Go there, to Meadowbrook Asylum. Find the portraits. Find the portraits, I'm telling you they're there. Before Jordan can say anything else, his father enters the room, staring at Officer Price. His eyes narrowed at her. Don't you have some place to be, Officer? I thought this was supposed to be a follow-up, not an interrogation. She turns her attention to the dad. Sorry, sir, we were just finishing up. Officer Price places her card on the table with a piece of writing on it before exiting the house. Jordan's father kneels beside him, placing his hand on Jordan's shoulder. Calm down, son. You all right? Jordan gives a slight nod. I'm okay, Dad. It just got to my head. Can I have some alone time, please? He replies by giving him a loving hug. After his dad leaves the room, Jordan turns his attention to the piece of writing on the officer's card, reading it to himself. Jordan, what you said about the asylum, I believe there is something more to that place. Something wrong. That place, there's something more to it than we know. Stay away from it. His jaw drops. Did he make a mistake revealing he was inside the asylum? With fearful thoughts filling his mind, he exits the chair and goes to the living room couch. Again, he reads the note, petrified of its contents. More questions than answers filled his mind. He takes a look at the note one more time, nearly going into a panic attack. Back at the police station, Officer Price sits at her desk, staring at the computer screen, wondering more about the asylum. She looks at the story given to the public about how it was destroyed. The public article shows a black and white photo of Meadowbrook Asylum on fire. The article tells of a short-circuit explosion that started in the boiler room, causing an explosion that nearly destroyed the entire asylum. Noticing the article said nothing about a safety issue, she looked up all of the inspections done on the asylum in 1978. Upon examination, the asylum had never failed an inspection in all of its existence. This new information piqued her curiosity. How could the circuits create such a mess if they passed the examination? The people who did the inspections wouldn't mark the asylum safe if there was a risk. Taking a deep breath, she stares deeply at the computer, not knowing what to make of this new information. She follows the question and only leads in her head. What did Jordan mean about the portraits? She exits the police station, getting into her car driving off to the asylum to figure out the truth behind it. Now at Meadowbrook Asylum, the feeling of goosebumps creep inside her. 
Even in the daylight, it looked scary. You could see the scarred letters of the name Meadowbrook above the entrance. The windows are covered in wood, but not all spaces of the windows are filled. Across every window, there is a small line of light coming from inside. A line just small enough to where a person could watch you without anyone noticing. Officer Price couldn't get that thought out of her mind. She circles to the back of the asylum, looking at the door that Jeff opened. Officer Price approaches the back door, picking the lock. As it opens, the door creates a loud, shattering creak, similar to a human scream. She enters, closing the door behind her. A feeling of torment and disgust fills the air around her. Even with the sunlight coming in from the cracked windows, the asylum was still very dark. She pulls out her flashlight, revealing the room to have splintered walls filled with stained burn marks, patches of loose paint, and holes fill the floor. A brief examination of the room shows nothing of interest. Her perception of interest was now at an all-time high as she descended further into the asylum. She takes in the environments of the asylum. Everything seems reasonable until a slight creak from the floorboards gets her attention. The feeling of being watched that passed through her before was now back. She shines the flashlight on the wall where the sound came from to reveal an eye-sized hole in the wall. Curiously, Officer Price looks through to see what's on the other side of the wall. Inside is a picture of some kind. Before she could examine it further, a loud thud from the other side of the hall startles her. Immediately, she draws her gun, ready for anything or anyone else to be in the asylum. With the gun in one hand and the flashlight in the other, she follows the location of the sound. Falling bits of dirt come from above, gracing her face. She hears scratches and footsteps above, too loud to be any vermin. Putting away her gun, she reaches for her radio. Dispatch, this is Officer Ashley Price. I'm at the Meadowbrook Asylum. I'm calling for immediate backup. Static fills the air. Dispatch, this is Officer Price requesting immediate backup. I'm- A man's laugh echoes from the other end of the radio. In an eerie tone, the man says, <laughs> You just got here. Why would you want to leave? She stares blankly at the radio. Sweat starts to slide down the back of her neck. If this is someone joking around, it's not funny. A slithery voice replies. My dear, this is no joke. You won't be talking to anyone else but me. A slight pause ensues, making Officer Price start to regret her decision to come to the asylum. Replying with more resistance in her voice, she blasts out. You better knock this off. I am a police officer. I will arrest you if you keep talking like that. The man lets out a sinister laugh, whispering into the radio. <laughs> Do you think you can arrest me? You've had my attention from the moment you entered here. Tell me, what are you trying to find? She yells back. I'm trying to find the two missing boys, so would you mind helping me out? The man's voice over the radio plagues the room. I don't want to help. In fact, I'm watching your every move. She calls his bluff. Really? What am I doing right now? The man replies in a loose tone. Holding a gun at a dirty broken wall inside my asylum. She runs, making her way back to the door. This was enough for one day. She put her hand around the handle to the door, pulling with all her weight. The door stays in place, jammed. Her flashlight begins to go dim, and the sunlight outside starts to fade to black. The man, in his sinister voice, whispers through the radio. I want you to know something. There's no way to leave this place. You sealed your fate. Suddenly, the light from the outside sky shines into the asylum, and her flashlight works again. Only this time, she is in an endless hall with no doors. 
The room around her is encircled by portraits of people dying and in torment. It's like she teleported from one place to another. One of the portraits shows a man picking at his arm with a scalpel. Blood soaks the floor, with chunks of muscle and skin splattered across the floor. Another portrait shows a man injecting a drill into his head, having the expression of laughing as tears of blood form down his face. Officer Price picks up the radio with trembling hands, trying to hide the fear in her voice. What do you want? To see what your insides look like. A short pause fills the room before the man replies in a low tone. She drops the radio, breaking it, her body trembling at the words of the man. She gets her gun and flashlight stance back, making her way slowly through the hall, searching every corner of every room. Eventually, she reaches a staircase leading down. Conflict soars through her head if she should take the stairs or not. In all likelihood, an exit wasn't down there, but her only exit was gone now. She descends the stairs, still holding the gun to her body. At the bottom, a room with lights, ruins, tiles, and torn paintings fill her vision. Her thoughts are interrupted by a dragging sound coming from the other side of the room. Spotting a tilted desk, she takes cover behind it. The sound was just now a few feet from her. Slowly, she peeks her head out, seeing one of the figures. She gets the extreme urge to vomit from the sight and smell of it. The figure looks to be seven feet tall. Its gray skin reflects off the light. Bones and limbs protrude from its stomach and arms. Its eyes look like they were taken off a doll and glued on. It lifts its head in the air, making a wheezing, snorting noise, letting out an unsettling growl. It says deeply, What brings you here? Do you wish to see our headmaster? She stays quiet, holding her position as the figure gets closer and closer. Come out, come out, wherever you are. It says in a childish tone. Officer Price grips the gun as hard as she can and, in a quick motion, rises to her feet, shooting the deformed figure. She fires four bullets, two missing but the other two hit their target in the stomach and leg. A silver substance leaks from its wounds, forcing the creature to let out an abnormal scream, which wasn't human. Ashley runs from the figure, hearing it pursue behind her. The speed of it outmatched hers, and she knew it. Knowing it would catch her at any moment, she finds the nearest door, closing it. Seconds later, it stops in front of the door, Clapping its hands in victorious rhythm, it murmurs. Say hello to the headmaster for me. Before she could move, a hand reached over her shoulder, covering her mouth. She tried to resist, but the man had complete control over her. She hears the voice of the man from the radio behind her. I'm glad we can finally talk face to face. Fear takes over her recognizing the voice to be the man from the radio. Officer Price tries to get loose from the man's grip, but he is too strong. Let me go! Let me go! Now, now, I can't do that. But now I have seen you, it's time you see me. Beware. The sight isn't a pretty one. He turns the officer around, revealing a scar across his face. The man wears a white lab coat, covered with bloodstains. His hair is colored gray, with eyes faded so black it looks to be an endless tunnel. Burn scars cover the left side of his face. His lips were crisp and chapped. In a calm voice, he says, You have entered my realm. Don't fight it. There's no way out. After all, you're mine now. She tries to muffle through his hand. What do you want from me? Ignoring her, he drags Officer Price into a room lit with candles displaying multiple figures formed into a circle. They gather together at the side of the man, aligned in a pattern waiting for an order. The man snaps his fingers together, releasing the grip around her. 
Two figures grab her arms. The grip was so secure she couldn't move. He stands beside her, whispering. The thing I wanted before, I'm going to have it now. Tears fill Ashley's eyes. What? He looks to the table on the left, seeing a hammer and picking it up from the table. He approaches Officer Price slowly, hellacious intent displayed over his face. What are you going to do with that? No! No! He ignores her pleas, hitting her kneecaps with the hammer. Snaps of broken bones fill the room, causing the figure to look away in disgust. Officer Price screams in agony, tears and sweat running down her face as she cried. The man puts his hand to his ear. A beautiful smile forms across his face as he cries in joy. Music to my ears. Oh, such beautiful sounds. Scream again. Scream. Let it all out. Another strike comes from the hammer, this time hitting her ribs. She lets out a loud cough. Blood falls from her mouth, and she goes unconscious from the pain. Humming out loud, the man says, It's been some time since I've seen blood. Oh, such precious blood. I want to see more. I want to see yours. The man walks over to the other side of the room, searching through a cabinet. One of the figures holding her speaks. Will the painter know about this? The man puts a finger across his lips, hushing them. I'm sure he already knows, but please, let's not talk about that. I want to enjoy this moment. It's been a while since I, Dr. Sebastian Langstrom, has killed somebody, and I want to make my return so, so beautiful. He approaches her one more time, holding a bone saw, scalpel, needle, and multiple tourniquets from the cabinet, putting on a surgical mask. He injects an adrenaline shot into Officer Price, her eyes slowly opening back up. Signaling for the figures to leave, they drop her to the ground, while an evil smirk forms across the man's chapped lips. Holding her face, he strokes her hair slowly, inserting the knife slowly into her chest. He chuckles to himself, watching the blood protrude from the wound. He stares at her with that evil grin, smiling as he says, Now, let's see what your insides look like. Jordan awakens from his nap, surprised to see an empty house. It catches him off guard when he sees a note and a mailed envelope on the kitchen island. Approaching the note, he picks it up, reading it out loud. Jordan, it's your father. I went to see Uncle Charles for the night. There is cooked chicken in the fridge, and there is an envelope for you. If there are any problems, or if you need me, you know my number. Putting down the paper, Jordan turns his attention to the envelope. He sees it has no return address and is unmarked, making him hesitant to open it. But he decides to read it again after some thinking. Upon opening the envelope, a scroll slides outspread across the table. Mr. Myers, you have awoken something you cannot control. The events that transpired at the asylum have begun something you cannot comprehend. I could tell you to stay away from the asylum but I know you have observed the portraits. We have to speak before people start noticing and become involved. There's only one place where we can meet without having to bother about the portraits. You must arrive at the asylum and wait on the first floor. I am not forcing you here. However, this will be your single opportunity to fix the problem you helped generate. I will be at the asylum tonight on the first floor at 8 p.m. Come or not, it's your choice. If you do, I will provide you with all the answers. Jordan's hands tremble. How did this person know he was in the asylum? What were these events? What is so important about the portraits? There were so many questions he wanted to ask. He thinks to himself, Did this all happen because Jeff ruined a picture? Facing around the kitchen, he thinks of what he could do. 
Going to the asylum would give him a chance to meet the stranger and get some answers, but going to the asylum again could kill him. Was this man telling the truth? Knowing this is his only chance to avenge his friends, Jordan exits the house to go to the asylum. He exits the door, not knowing what to expect. Knowing there were things beyond his understanding, he had no way to repair what this man was talking about. Could it have been some sick joke, or was this man telling the truth? He knew there could only be one way, and that was going to the asylum. After twenty minutes of walking, he studies the Meadowbrook Asylum's front of the building, where it all started. He was never afraid of it in the past. Now the mere sight of it made him have a near panic attack. He sees the broken window on the second floor. The memory of the jump forms in his mind. He disregards it, going through the courtyard. He listens to the crunching of the gravel under his feet. He goes to the back of the asylum, remembering where the door is. After walking around the building, the door is visible. The padlock, used to hold the door the first time, is still on the ground. Jordan kicks it away, not wanting to remember what happened after entering the first time. Mustering a bundle of courage, he opens the door. A pile of dust and grime come from the top of it, dropping onto him, causing him to cough multiple times. In the asylum, a dimly lit room stands ahead of him at the end of the hall. He follows the light, entering the room. The surroundings of the room made him feel somewhat at peace. Two lounge chairs sit across from each other. A new patch of floor replaced the previously crushed tiles on the floor. The formerly stained burnt walls were no more. Fresh ones had replaced them. He stood in awe before hearing a man clear his voice at the other end of the room. A small man with a black suit and grey glasses blocking his eyes signals Jordan's attention. He is a very skinny, frail-looking man, appearing to be in his late seventies. He has no hair except for a trimmed grey beard. The man points to the chair, signaling for Jordan to take a seat. The two take a seat from each other, resting his arms on the cushion, staying quiet, creating an uncomfortable atmosphere. Speaking with open-hearted determination in his voice, Jordan asks, Are you the one that sent me the letter? Responding to the question, the man takes off his glasses, showing pale white eyes. In a leisurely gesture, he nods yes. Why did you send it? The man raises a hand, pointing to Jordan. In a low, crisp tone, he replies. You destroyed a portrait. Jordan narrows his eyes angrily. A portrait? My friends are dead because of a portrait? Jordan could barely contain himself. Jeff destroyed it, not me. Besides, how could you tell I was here? The man points to two figures, signaling they are the ones. A shriek of terror from Jordan fills the room as two figures come from both sides of the room. He attempts to run from them, but one of their hands rests on his shoulder, keeping him pinned to the chair no matter how hard he tries to resist. Get this thing off me. The figure calmly speaks. We don't want to hurt you. The stranger clears his throat, his voice no longer crisp. He whispers to Jordan in a faint tone. These abominations, or as you call them, figures, listen to me. If you cooperate and listen, this will be much easier. You're probably wondering what they are. Well, they are the results of events I've tried long and hard to forget. But your friend made a grave mistake. He destroyed a portrait, and by doing that, he awakened them and their creator. Jordan punches the chair, visibly angry. What are you talking about? This makes no sense. You, you said you would give me the answers to what was going on in the scroll, not the story of what these things are. Tell me what is going on. The man lets out a chuckle at him, with minor coughs in between. Putting his hand across his face, the man speaks. 
Ah, these days, young people have no patience. In time, you'll know everything. But let me introduce myself. My name is Jacob Wilson. I used to work here at Meadowbrook Asylum before the fire. I was good friends with the asylum's head director, Sebastian Langstrom, the Abomination's creator, or as the figures call him, the headmaster. The Abominations also know me as the painter. One of the figures speaks up, their voice shaken. The headmaster and the painter made all of us before the explosion happened. Jordan remains silent with keen interest in what Jacob has to say. The story of an electrical fire is a lie. That isn't what caused the explosion. Sebastian himself caused it. You've probably seen him in the portraits of the nightmares you have. If you have nightmares, he'll be the man with the lab coat. Jordan looks back at Jacob in confusion, questioning the statements of his nightmare. You have the nightmares too? Jordan, I've had the nightmares ever since the destruction of the asylum and the ending of mine and Sebastian's fun. Jordan tilts his head in confusion. What fun is that? Jacob squeezes his hand against the leather of the chair, giving the signal of a touchy subject. Sebastian and I tortured people. We'd inflict pain onto people by doing monstrous things to them they would never do to themselves. The pain caused by us would form a look on their face, a face of pain that is near death. Jordan looks at Jacob in the eye. You're a sick bastard who deserves the nightmares. Jacob gives a nod of acknowledgement with hesitance in his voice. Uh, maybe we were sick. We selected patients in the asylum who had no family, friends, or emergency contacts. Sebastian brought them to a hidden room in his office. There he tortured them while I drew portraits of their deathly tortures. It was golden. The joy we felt was unbelievable. So why did you and your friends stop doing this so-called fun? Jacob's eyes start to water. As they say, all good things must come to an end. And Sebastian wanted to end with a bang, literally. One of the patients was able to escape and alert the police of our activities. So we told the police, and they came to the asylum to get you and Sebastian? Jacob nods in response. I'd already left the asylum. I knew everything was finished, yet Sebastian couldn't let it go. He blew up the boiler room, killing himself and everyone in the asylum. Jordan puts his hands to his chin, confused. How does this have anything to do with me? Oh, the destruction of the portrait revived Sebastian, bringing his attention back to the real world. Enraged by this, he's brought the victim's spirits from the explosion with him into this world, creating the figures. His bloodlust has returned. He killed a female police officer not too long ago, and this is only the beginning. If anyone enters this place, he will kill them. Sebastian's spirit has been awoken. You're the only one that can stop him and this from happening. What do you mean to stop this? You mean Sebastian and these figures, or whatever they are? Jacob snaps his fingers. Precisely. Right now, Sebastian's in purgatory or as I call it, the portrait world. Every person who died from the boiler room explosion or by Sebastian and I are bound to the portraits. Their spirits can't leave them. As a result, they reside in a limbo-like afterlife, only accessible through a portrait. Jordan cries out in panic. Wait, you mean the afterlife as in people being dead? So if I'm alive, how can I get into the asylum? You need to be in the portrait world. So I'm going to make a portrait of you. Jordan's face goes pale. Hold on. You told me anyone you paint their spirit is bound to that portrait. So why do you want to put me there? Jacob rises from the chair, walking to one of the corners of the room. Reaching into a bag, he takes out an easel and a piece of paper. They were bound because Sebastian tortured them until they died. When they died, the portrait showed their last moments alive. That is where their souls would go as a result. And since you're not in any pain, you'll be free to do whatever you want in there. Jordan 
outraged by this news, tries to rise from the chair. The figure again holds him steady in the chair, refusing to let him escape. Jacob yells out loud, This is your only chance to avenge your friends. This strikes Jordan in the heart, making him nod in response. Do it. Draw a portrait of me. Jacob takes out his paintbrush and paint from the bag, rubbing his hand against it with a disturbing smile. My, my, it's been 41 years since I've used these. I'm going to paint you now. Don't move. When I'm done with the painting, you'll awaken in the portrait world. Once there, you'll have to find the boiler room and make it explode. Only then can Sebastian be destroyed. Tears of sweat and fear start to run down Jordan's face. With all of his might, he asks, What will happen when it explodes? Painting the portrait, Jacob answers with determination. Every spirit inside the purgatory will die, including your friend. The explosion will destroy all the portraits freeing the bounded soul. But don't worry, since your portrait isn't in pain, you'll be able to keep your soul and body. You'll not become a figure. My friend is still alive? Yes, for now. Look for him if you must, but remember, destroying the asylum is your priority. As long as that place still exists, Sebastian can create figures and kill people here without a problem. Jacob gives a quiet signal to the room. Thirty minutes pass, and the painting is almost complete. Right. In a couple of minutes, I'll be done painting you. After I paint you, you'll enter the portrait world. You'll know when you're there. Your arm will no longer be broken, and you'll not feel pain. You'll awaken in the asylum disguised as a patient. No one will know the difference. This time, confidence comes from Jordan's voice. I go into the portrait world, find the boiler room, blow it up, and everyone is free? It sounds easy enough, but what happens if something goes wrong? Oh, I can't help you there. Oh, one more thing. Don't let Sebastian see you or find you. He knows you're coming. You'll recognize him as the man in a white lab coat with the deep red eyes, but I'm sure he's already glued into your memory. With the portrait finished, Jordan tries to keep his eyes open, but they become blurry and shaky until his eyes close. The world becomes silent and dark around him. He awakens inside the asylum, lying on a hospital bed, dressed in a hospital gown. Just like Jacob said, his arm is no longer broken. Looking around, he is amazed at the asylum's look. The walls are painted white, and the floors spotless. Phones are heard ringing in the distance, and the doctors roam the halls. Jordan was now in the portrait world. The bright light from the room blinds Jordan's eyes, forcing him to cover his eyes. He examines the room, rising from the cot making out the freshly painted teal walls around him. The room is scented with roses and has a feeling of recreation. He felt calm, but this feeling would go away at the sight in front of him. Empty beds with blankets stained with blood covered the room. The stench of roses soon turned to death, permeating the room. From this room alone, He knew he was in the portrait world, the place where Sebastian resides, waiting to torture and kill people who entered the asylum. His first steps onto the ground created a rush of vertigo that conveyed his vision, nearly causing him to pass out. Grabbing his head, Jordan mumbles to himself. Okay, take your time. Just went into another world. Let's get out of this room, one step at a time. He clutches the wall, using it to help reach the door on the other side of the room. Stumbling across the room, he reaches the door's handle, opening it to exit the room. The room beyond reveals a white corridor, 
Unlike the earlier room, it was a utopia. There were neither signs of death or torture. Instead, paintings of trees and weather filled a hall line. It was pleasing to know Sebastian has an excellent style in art besides pictures of death. Suddenly, a dark-haired man with green eyes wearing a white lab coat notices Jordan. They both exchange a stolid and stressful stare down. The man approaches him. Jordan feels a rush of fear. Jacob never told him what to do if one of the doctors tried to talk to him. He had two situations to get past this. The first was to run from the doctor, creating a scene. The second one is to talk to the doctor and blend in with the patients there. The doctor scans Jordan with an expression of surprise in his eyes. Scratching his head, he asks in a questioning tone, What do we have here, a new patient? What are you doing out of your room? Before Jordan could reply, the doctor taps the clipboard with his pen. Curiously, the doctor says, Wait, I've never seen you here. Could you be the one the headmaster fears? Jordan shakes his head in confusion. What are you talking about? The doctor's expression turns to fear as sweat pours down his face. His hands shake intensively as a quavering force takes over him. In a trembling tone, he expresses the fear in his voice. Y you're Jordan Myers? The doctor walks back, nearly tripping over himself. Jordan steps forward, itching his head, confused by the man's question. What if I am? What does this have to do with your sudden change of behavior? The doctor's face grows red with terror. The headmaster, he desires to obtain you. I can't let him know you're here. If he sees me talking to you, I'll be embedded with feelings of pain I've never felt in my life. With those words, the doctor walks away. Jordan stands there, shocked by what the doctor said. This is the real deal. Sebastian controls this place and everyone. He doesn't pursue the doctor thinking it would be best to keep his notice to a minimum. Before he advances, he notices the clipboard the doctor previously held on the ground. He picks it up. Three papers are on it. The first is labeled Patients. On it are the names of everyone inside the asylum. He almost flips the page over before one name catches his attention. Matthew Richardson. Jordan couldn't believe what he was seeing. His friend, the one he thought to be dead, was here, in the portrait world. He didn't know where to look. Desperately, he searched, flipping over the next piece of paper showing the second page. On the second paper is a map. There are three circled rooms covered in blue highlighter with labels of their room names under them. The first reads Headmaster's Office. The sights of the word Headmaster makes Jordan shudder. There was no way his first destination would be there. The second highlighted room says Patient Registration, and the third, Sebastian's Private Chamber. God only knew what that implied. After a study of the three rooms, he concludes on Patient Registration. If Matt were in the asylum, that would be the best place to look for clues. On the way to patient registration, Jordan takes in the looks of the building. This is what the asylum looked like in its working days. Unlike the destroyed looking one in his world. This one is full of clean, open patient rooms. Doctors and nurses fill the halls with working equipment. Its appearance presents it as a standard hospital. But something wasn't right. When you would come into a person's view, be it a doctor or patient, their eyes opened in terror. People who were talking became mute. Though he never talked to any of them, it looked like they were muttering the words help under their breaths. Even if he wanted to, he couldn't do it now. He had to find Matt and destroy this place, he thinks to himself, as he enters the room marked patient registration above it. 
As soon as Jordan enters the room, he sees a shade of green surrounding the room. Small groups of men and women in catatonic states are seated in wheelchairs, staring at the wall in separate corners of the room. Some patients who had some sense in them look at him, giving him an uncanny feeling. Some are wide-eyed, while others smile apprehensively. Ignoring the distractions, he sees a young woman with blonde hair and blue eyes in a nursing outfit, writing in a notebook behind a desk. Suspecting this to be a nurse, he approaches her, clearing his throat, getting her attention. She raises her head unfazed, and in an unpleasant tone, asks, Why are you wearing a patient gown, sir? He forgot about the gown. Jordan nervously tries to come up with the best lie he could think of. Oh, well you see, I came here to ask for a fresh set of clothes because I was ready to leave. She stares at him with blue eyes and a tiresome voice. Sir, no one leaves this place. The last sentence makes his stomach drop. Did Jacob lie? Is there no way out? Knowing it would be best if he didn't wear a gown, he asks. Can you give me some new clothes? I don't like the gown I'm wearing. The nurse grunts, standing up from her chair as she enters the room behind her. With the woman gone, he looks over the desk to study the notebook she was writing in. The labeled words, patient numbers, and ward locations in the notebook got his attention. He glances across the room, noticing the people no longer paying attention to him. Quickly, he grabs the notebook, sliding it into one of the pockets on the gown. A minute later, the nurse arrives at the desk, handing Jordan a shirt and blue trousers. She rolls her eyes, asking, Is there anything else you need? He readies to leave before an overwhelming noise comes from the right side of the room. A set of men in white lab coats walks through a door, turning their attention to one of the men in the wheelchairs. The headmaster will see you now, Mr. Woodson. The man in the wheelchair, who Jordan presumes to be Mr. Woodson, shouts into a frenzy. The once catatonic inmate, who sat in the corner inaudibly, was now screaming indiscriminately. No. No. Anyone but the headmaster, help me. Please. Someone. Someone help me. The group of men restrains him while another pulls a syringe from his pocket, pushing it into his arm. Mr. Woodson's movements start to become slower and slower before his eyes close. Quietly, the woman at the corner lets out a chuckle. The headmaster will surely enjoy this one, she says, grinning ear to ear. What do you mean, enjoy? Jordan spins around, asking the lady. She stares off in the distance, speaking absent-mindedly. Sebastian loves to hear those who scream of fear and anguish from those he tortures. In his dark and twisted mind, one thing repeats that he tells us again and again. The longer the pieces of my collection fear death, the more they will beg and cry to be free, even though such a thing as freedom never existed. With those final words, Jordan exits the patient's registration as quickly as he entered. If he could guess what she meant by her little speech, the man would die terribly. Out in the hall, he is watching the staff walk around, tending to the sick. Jordan holds the notebook close to his chest, the only clue to finding Matt in his hands. Again, the sight of Jordan causes everyone to suspend their actions or conversation. Their eyes burn into his skin as they gaze at him, doing nothing else. He does his best to ignore it, before finding an empty storage closet. He locks the door behind him, putting on the shirt and the trousers the nurse gave him. Now better dressed, he pulls out the notebook, scanning through it. Most of the pages contain useless information except for the last page. Patient numbers and locations are what he needed. The page displays patient numbers, serial numbers, and locations of the patients. He starts to read the journal in his head. Dana Hoxter, 
Patient number 342, Ward C. Ivan Stewart, patient number 264, Ward C. Matthew Richardson, patient number 547, Ward B. Knowing Matt's location, Jordan opens the door to the storage closet. He's met by an unfamiliar scene, making him drop the notebook. The hall is empty. Moments ago, it was full of people. Now there wasn't a person in sight. The portraits on the walls were what caught his attention. It was Mr. Woodson, the man whom Jordan saw in the patient registration room. When Jordan last saw him, he had a trimmed gray beard and seemed to be a short man. The details were vague due to the distance between them. Across the wall, portraits show torture he went through. No doubt Sebastian's work. And some of them, he has no skin on his body. Others showed organs and puddles of blood on the floor beneath him. The horrific detail shown in a certain one is the last one in the hall. It displays Mr. Woodson held to a wooden stick, hoisted by chains in the appearance of a crucifixion. His stomach shows open wounds by some type of sharp object. Jordan covers his mouth, attempting not to gag. The people here don't deserve this. He was the only one who could set the people free. Squinting through the portraits, he could outline scribbled words with an arrow pointing left. Cautiously, he walks up to it, reading the words to himself. Ward B, rooms 500 to 575. Jordan races down the hall, watching the numbers on the rooms start to decrease until room 547 is in front of him. He grasps the doorknob, pushing the door open with absolute silence. The room is dark, covered in all white except for a bed in the middle. Someone lays on the bed, coughing weakly. Slowly, Jordan approaches it, whispering. Matt, is that you? A quiet grunt of acknowledgement comes from the person in the bed. Taking this to be Matt, Jordan walks to the bed overtaken with joy to see his friend again before a familiar voice comes from the bed. Mistake. Suddenly, two figures enter the room blocking the entrance. They let out a small laugh, pointing to the bed behind. Instantly, a slight pinch across the side of Jordan's neck sends him barreling to the floor. He turns to see Sebastian rising from the bed, holding a syringe. He claps his hands together the sinister smile forming across his face. Well, well, look who we have here. (laughs) The famous Jordan Myers, Sebastian says playfully. Jordan tries to rise to his feet, taking the needle out of his neck, coughing along the way as he weakly says, (coughs) Go fuck yourself. Looking down, Sebastian smirks. His red eyes fill the room with an exhilarating tone. He says with glee, You know something? I've heard so much about you from the figures, and that talk you had with Jacob was just brilliant. Sebastian kicks Jordan's hand, causing him to fall to the ground once more. I didn't think I'd be able to meet you. You're the first person to escape my figures. You escaped death. Too bad your friends weren't so lucky. He kneels beside him, whispering like a snake. Isn't it poetic after all this time? You belong to me now. Again, Jordan tries to rise to his feet, attempting to speak, but the syringe's effects soon make him unconscious. The last words he hears before the world goes black is, Don't waste your energy. Shortly you'll be dreaming, and when you awake, We can have fun. Sebastian says to Jordan, laughing maniacally. (laughs) I have special plans for you. Jordan awakens, finding himself tied to a chair. His wrists bound to both sides, refusing him to move. Attempting to figure out where he is, he looks around the room, yelling. Help. Help. Is anyone there? His question is met with complete silence. 
he could do nothing but look at the wall in front of him. The room resents a revolting shade of red. He looks around, seeing engravings on the wooden panel. They are in a language he can't understand. Portraits of people in different tortured positions fill the room. Across the room, Jordan notices a group of surgical instruments with the words Playtime Instruments on them. Neatly across it are scissors, an iron rod, a pot of boiled water, a thumb screw, and pliers. He tries again to free his bindings, but to no avail. Suddenly, the door opens behind him. Sebastian enters the room. His expression shows a demented smile, giving the message these next few minutes were going to be painful. Jordan snaps at Sebastian. What the fuck do you think you're smiling about, you psycho? Let me go. Sebastian shakes his finger, looking into the boy's eyes, taunting him. Sorry, I can't do that. You've already escaped me once and I can't let it happen again. After all, I have a reputation to keep around here. But now that you're awake, we can finally get to work. Jordan hisses at Sebastian. You're fucking insane. Sebastian lets off a slight sarcastic shrug. Funny, I don't hear that one a lot. Jordan pleads. All these people you've hurt, they, they don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. Sebastian, ignoring the speech across the room, moves the table of the torturous instruments beside him. He lets out a sigh as he picks up a scalpel. <sighs> Has Jacob been telling you sob stories? Sebastian's dead eyes study the tool with hellacious interest. Don't you realize that these people are incurable? The only thing they deserve is pain and misery for what they've done to other people. Jordan retorts. Jacob told me what you did to your patients. The paintings and the murders. How could you do it? They're incurable. Sebastian's detached tone morphs into an aggressive growl. I was willing to do what others couldn't. Jordan scoffs at him. So that meant killing them and trapping their souls into portraits? Sebastian smashes his fist into the table, but takes a deep breath to restrain himself. He calmly sets the scalpel down on the table. His long fingers coil across the table's edge like ten dead serpents. Cracks and snaps echo through the room. A spark of madness ignites Sebastian's widening eyes as he explains. God can't judge these people. Only I can. You're not even a human. Jordan whispers. Tilting his head, Sebastian chuckles evilly. You make it sound like you're in hell. This is hell. The way you treat these people. Sebastian smirks wickedly with a satanic tone. There's something I want you to know, and that is this. This place isn't hell. His smirk now ear to ear. I am what makes it hell. He quickly reaches for the pliers, inserting them into Jordan's mouth. But Jordan counters, biting down onto Sebastian's finger. With a groan of pain, he removes his finger from Jordan's mouth, looking at it in pain. A short expression of hurt forms on his face, turning to a frightful laugh. The feeling of surprise creeps on him, seeing blood from his finger. The collective doctor shows the expression of a surprised man. In a hellacious tone, Sebastian whispers, You'll pay for that. Jordan spits at him. Go ahead. Do your worst. Sebastian opens a cabinet from the table, revealing a set of mouth props. Quickly, he forces the mouth props into Jordan's mouth. With the prop now inside, he couldn't close his mouth. Again, Sebastian pushes the pliers into his mouth, grasping two of Jordan's teeth, pulling them out. Blood streams from Jordan's mouth as he screams out in pain, making him struggle for air. The feeling of torment rushes through his body, causing him to nearly pass out. See, that wasn't hard now, was it? Sebastian says, wiping the blood off his face. Jordan doesn't blink at the question. Instead, he coughs out blood, landing on Sebastian. Slowly wiping the blood from his face, he sighs in disappointment. 
I was going to save this for last, but you've forced my hand. Now I'm going to make you scream. Sebastian eyes the thumbscrew with the smile of a serpent. He grabs it, admiring the device in the light. Jordan widens his eyes with shock. What the fuck is that? His eyes were glued to the gadget in front of him. Sebastian explains. This item is called a thumbscrew. Thomas Clarkson created it in the 1800s to crush prisoners' fingers, and because you're misbehaving, that will cost you a finger. He puts the contraption into Jordan's index finger. With a slow turn, the device activates, twisting his finger sideways, hearing sharp cracks. With the blood dripping from his mouth, Jordan cries out. Why are you doing this to me? He screams, trying to break the restraints. When you entered my asylum, one of your friends broke a portrait of mine. These portraits mean everything to me. It shows my accomplishments and how I've changed the world for the better. Your friend destroyed something significant to me. I believe his name was... Jeff? Sebastian says, scratching his chin in self-assurance. Jeff's name makes Jordan jump from the chair, nearly breaking the restraints. Jordan growls, his voice consumed my madness. Don't you dare talk about him like that. He did nothing to you. Sebastian winks. The mention of your friend strikes a nerve, does it? The machine finishes with one final crunch. Jordan's index finger was dangling, tossed in the opposite direction of where it originally was. Sebastian puts his hands on his cheeks, smiling. Such a beautiful sight, isn't it? The sounds of pain and vision of grief on a person's face. It makes me smile so much. He looks Jordan in the eye with sharp words, playfully saying, Just like Matt. Jordan's voice shakes the room. What the fuck did you do to him? Well, well, aren't you interested? <laughs> Since we're playing 20 questions, I don't see any crime in telling you. I swear if you did anything to him, I'll fucking kill you. Sebastian stops and looks at Jordan. You may have escaped the first time, but do you know what Matt did? He ran straight into my office. Letting out a menacing chuckle, Sebastian continues in his dark tone. Because I've been dormant for so long, I've required a person to practice my skills on. His calm demeanor was now a vicious monotone. He begged for his life and it didn't mean anything to me. All he did was talk, so I had to silence him. Sebastian gestures a sewing and cutting motion with his hands. I sewed his mouth shut, his voice changing to a menacing tone. I took a scalpel and removed the top of his skull, revealing his brain. I had never done anything like this, so I was just as surprised as he was when I saw it. Fighting the urge to vomit, Jordan lets out. You bastard. I took a sewing needle, taking the brain apart piece by piece. I had to get a memory of it. Pointing to a curtain, Sebastian moves towards it. I took Matt inside, killing him and bringing him back to life multiple times, but this, this portrait is my favorite. Without remorse, Sebastian releases the curtain, revealing the contents behind it. Under it is a portrait of Matt. Chunks of brain matter lay on the floor. His arms lay in pieces, and the skin across his face is now bone and tendon. Jordan yells, nearly destroying his lungs. I'll fucking kill you. Do you hear me? I will fucking kill you. Just wait until I get out of here. Waving his finger, Sebastian taunts him. No, no, no. You see, I'm going to kill you. He strolls to the phone on his desk. With the phone in his hand, he pushes buttons, dialing for someone. A woman on the other end instantly picks up a sense of fear in her voice. Front desk, how can I help you, Headmaster? 
I need you to send Dr. Irving up. She'll be up right away. Thank you. He hangs up the phone, admiring his portraits along the wall. Jordan lets out a weak breath. I'm not gonna beg. If you're gonna kill me, just do it. At least I'll be free of this hellhole. You're one sick fuck, and I hope you get what's coming for you. Before Sebastian could reply, the door opens, revealing a short woman wearing a white jacket with blonde hair and green eyes. She enters the room, a look of pity formed across her face. Sebastian opens his arms in joy. Ah, Dr. Irving, my friend, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Keep an eye on my patient as I grab the advanced tools, please. In a soulless tone, she nods. Of course, Headmaster. As soon as Sebastian leaves the room, she runs over to Jordan, grabbing the restraints across his hands, breaking them. Jordan looks at her, confused. In a shocked tone, he questions. What are you doing? Dr. Irving explains in an eager tone. Helping you escape. I'm not the only one who wants to leave this afterlife asylum. Confusion fills his voice. How does helping me escape help you? We know you weren't in the original explosion. Dr. Irving's voice turns into a tone of help. It means your soul isn't bound to this place. She points at him, holding back tears. You can kill the headmaster and destroy this place. Jordan remembers the look of pain on Sebastian's face when he bit his finger. It now made sense. Sebastian can be hurt, and therefore killed, since he came here out of free will. The last restraint comes undone, causing Jordan to crumple onto the floor. He coughs blood from his mouth, spitting it onto the ground. Dr. Irving puts her arm over his shoulder, looking into Jordan's eyes, pleading with him. Please, you have to destroy this place. Destroy the boiler room in the basement. It's the only way this asylum can be destroyed. She points to all the portraits. Their souls will be free. All of us trapped here will be free. Including you. Jordan looks at her cautiously. Aren't you afraid of what will happen to you? Grim formality crosses Dr. Irving's face. She grabs Jordan's arm, ominously saying there's someone else in the boiler room. She pauses, thinking of all the terrors she has seen. Only Sebastian goes down to the basement. He says that's where his lost ones are. I don't know what they are, but I'm hoping none of us find out. This place is already full of terrors. Listening to her words, Jordan rises to his feet, ready to leave, before seeing the portraits on the walls. He remembers Sebastian praising their worthiness to him. He looks at them, rubbing the tips of his fingers on one. Jordan grins at the portrait. First, let me piss him off a little. Jordan takes the portrait of Matt, smashing it onto the ground, destroying it. Dr. Irving stands there, shocked. Never had someone rebelled against Sebastian this much. Feeling a rush of excitement, she takes a portrait, tossing it against the wall, destroying it. She looks at Jordan with a mix of despair and sorrow. We're wasting time. You need to get out of here and finish this. The door's at the end of the hall on the left. Free us from this hell! Jordan nods and grabs a scalpel from the surgical table for extra measure, exiting the room. The feeling of being at the asylum for the first time flows through his bones at its appearance. Dim lights cover the halls, with tiny drops of water leaking from the roof. Death fills the air, and small gusts of wind blow across the hall. A tone of misery comes from the door ahead of him. It's not a voice he recognized, so maybe the odds were in his favor for once. He opens the door revealing a man strapped onto a stainless table. Blood covers the man, creating a puddle underneath the wooden table he lays on. Open wounds were causing the man pain. 
Yet, he smiled, creating a sense of unease in the air. Looking closer, Jordan sees it to be Mr. Woodson. Cautiously, Jordan whispers from the door. Mr. Woodson, can you hear me? He shakes violently, moving the table left and right, blood spilling from the wounds as he stops, his eyes rolling back into his head as he says in a hazy voice, We don't live and we don't die. Jordan enters the room, closing the door behind him. Taking slow steps, he asks again, this time with more confidence. Mr. Woodson, are you okay? Can you hear me? His appearance is now more transparent, nearly causing Jordan to vomit. Black holes fill where his eyes should be. A smell of molten flesh comes from his stomach. Mr. Woodson attempts to rise to a sitting position, but the glue keeps him attached to the table. As he moves, the sound of trickling blood onto the floor fills the area. Twitching, he turns, facing Jordan. With his half-sewn shut mouth, he says, brainwashed. He hurts us. He always hurts us. There is no freedom. There is no hope. Our pain is what keeps us alive. Without pain, there is no life. Without life, the pain will seize me. I mean nothing. I am nothing. I don't deserve the glory of a portrait. Jordan keeps his distance and asks, What are you talking about? You're not making any sense. Who I am means nothing. I belong to the Headmaster, and the Headmaster only. Soon, you'll belong to him too. Go to the basement, find the lost ones, end this all. Kill me. Set me free. I can't do that. Please, you can't ask me to do something like that. Hearing this, Mr. Woodson looks at Jordan. His face turns to madness. You must kill me. <laughs> He'll be back. I can't handle any more of this. Mr. Woodson again tries to rise from the table. The sound of flesh peeling from his back nearly made Jordan vomit. With panic, Jordan says to Mr. Woodson, I'm sorry, I can't help you right now, but soon, soon you'll be free, I promise. With those words, he exits the room. Sweat pours down his face as he looks across every corner for the basement door. A rush of urgency fills his body to the brim. All the pain he endured before was gone at the sight in front of him. The basement door was now in view. Sebastian hums in a leisurely tone, walking a surgical cart to his office, passing staff and patients. The nods and winks he gives them send shivers down the staff's spines. Outside the office, he puts on his mask, ready to finally kill Jordan. A satisfying grin forms on his face as he turns the knob to his office, entering it. Instantly, Sebastian lets go of the cart, dropping the items in his hands. All of Sebastian's portraits lay on the ground, cracked and ripped to pieces around the ground. A void of madness and destruction takes over Sebastian as he sees Dr. Irving reaching for one of the portraits, tearing it apart. In a fit of fury, he runs to her, grasping both his hands around her neck. What have you done to my portraits? The room nearly shakes from the rage, scorching from his mouth. Dr. Irving spits at Sebastian, replying, I'm doing what other people are afraid to do, and that's stopping you. Violently, he throws her to the other side of the room. His muscles and veins are tense, his voice so loud and intimidating it would make anyone freeze in fear. Do you know how long these took? How much they meant to me? Struggling to get up, looking into the eyes of the madman as he strides towards her. That's why I'm destroying them. Soon, Jordan will set all of us free. 
Sebastian grips her by the neck again, letting out a scream of anger. He turns her head around, breaking her neck. Her body goes limp, killing her instantly. He carries the lifeless body across the room, exiting his office. The crashing sound of the office door makes the staff turn to Sebastian. Never have they seen him in a mood like this. He stretches out the limp body of Dr. Irving, extending it to his staff in a demanding tone. Fine, Jordan Myers. Bring him to me. If you don't, this will be your fate. The staff, knowing their lives are in danger, scamper across the asylum. Sebastian turns back to the office, seeing his portraits in the ruins. He puts his hands over his head, growling loudly. I'll find you, you... you son of a bitch. Steadily, he approaches a bookshelf, pulling it from the hinges, causing it to collapse. Behind it is a small room, revealing figures gathered together, staring at Sebastian. He points to the figures. All of you out. You're to capture Jordan on sight. They move to the entrance before one looks back and protests. But Headmaster, didn't you want him alive? Sebastian's hands wrap around the figure's head, squeezing it furiously. Suddenly, its head explodes like a watermelon, splattering black liquid across the room. The figure's body falls back, hitting the ground with a sickening thud. Sebastian glances over, noticing a black sealed envelope among the shattered glass. He opens it, revealing the content inside. A photo of Jacob and Sebastian in their younger days, wearing suits. He whispers under his breath, crushing the photo. You brought him here to kill me, didn't you, old friend? I swear, if you're still in the asylum when this is over, I'll make you suffer until your last breath, Jacob. Jordan reaches the basement, only to be welcomed by a horrendous smell in a dark room. He couldn't see anything, nor hear anything. Holding his nose, he reaches the last step, hearing someone groan in the distance. Jordan replies with a panic in his voice. Who's there? Another loud, distressing groan is what he gets in reply, accompanied by another. Within seconds, the room is deafening with vile sounds screaming in every corner. He glides along the wall, looking for a light, struggling to stay conscious. He feels a square panel, pushing it as hard as he can. Finally, light floods the room, revealing the horrifying sight in front of him. The humidity and heat coming from the basement make it feel like a giant stew pot simmering, a sickening stew of feces, blood, and urine. Soon, Jordan realizes that this isn't a basement. It is a torturing center, holding people in cells. Haunting moans and blood-curdling cries echo from every room. A glimpse through the prison bars reveals people covered with pus-filled cuts and jagged scars. Jordan could feel the filth squish under his feet, but didn't dare to look at what they were slogging in. Instead, he fixes his gaze upon the poor souls in each rusty cage. Some of them have bloody stumps instead of arms and legs. Others stand in deranged silence, gnawing on their shredded flesh. Another disfigured person sits in the corner, scratching his empty eye sockets with a screwdriver to draw something on the wall. A painful groan catches Jordan's attention. It comes from a man with an empty mouth. His gums, teeth, and tongue are missing. Nothing but an empty blob of skin remains. Above this man is a sign. Lost causes. The man groans again, pointing to the other side of him. On the wall behind Jordan are the words, No more pain. It all makes sense now, what the lost causes are. The basement contains patients who no longer fear Sebastian or feel pain. 
Sebastian couldn't find a use for them or hurt them, since pain and fear don't exist in their minds. He keeps the ones he can't hurt in the basement. Abruptly, a sound comes above Jordan, causing him to stumble to the ground. The sound of a dragging limp, one that seemed all too familiar. The figures were coming. He looks at the groaning man. Where's the boiler room? He asks in desperation. Like a chorus, all the lost ones point to a small door in unison. Jordan dashes to the door, busting it down. The room entrance reveals a dark, steaming room with the sound of dragging footsteps coming from behind him. It was the figures. They were in the basement, knowing the danger of them. He hides behind a pipe. The figures walk towards one of the lost causes, grabbing their arms so hard you could hear the bones snap. It looks at the man, and in a silent, grisly tone, it asks, Where is Jordan? The lost one ignores the question, letting out a muffled tone. Don't you see? All you are is a lifeless husk. Soon you'll become one of us. You'll soon know your life isn't worth anything, even to the headmaster. When you do, he will have no use for you. You will become one of us. The words catch the figures off guard, making them let go of the man. Anyone who didn't feel pain from Sebastian ended up down here. All at once, the truth of the basement comes across them. They were going to end up down here, no matter what. A sense of retaliation and surrender come across the figures, knowing this would be their fate. Jordan couldn't believe the figures were showing human emotion. He didn't even think of them as human, but whatever they are, no one deserves a fate like this. Slowly, he exits the boiler room, looking at them, proclaiming, He doesn't care for any of you. Sebastian doesn't care for anyone here. All he wants is pain and despair. I'm willing to stop this. Soon this place can be- He's cut off as the door is thrown open. Sebastian invades the room. His dark red eyes lock onto Jordan. With a crisp tone, he taunts. What an inspiring speech. It's touching indeed. I don't care for anyone here, including you, Jordan. There's nowhere to hide now. I'm going to kill you, and then I'll make the asylum mine once again. One of the figures intervenes, grabbing his headmaster from behind. With a sharp instinct, Sebastian grabs the figure's arm, tearing it off in a single swipe. The figure falls to the ground, writhing in pain. In a betrayed tone, Sebastian screams. I've given you this gift and this is how you treat me? Jordan recoils back into the corner, watching the figures turn into a defensive stance. We're not afraid of you anymore, Headmaster. Sebastian approaches the remaining figures with a grim walk, a monstrous look on his face. Soon, you will be. Jordan didn't know what to do. He was trapped, and the only other door was blocked by the commotion. It looks like the end, before a doctor jumps on Sebastian's back. A feeling of numbness runs throughout Sebastian's neck, the sense of failing muscles filling his body. He looks behind him to see a doctor injecting a black serum into his neck. Shaking the needle off his neck, he hears massive amounts of footsteps approach the basement door. Doctors and nurses flood the basement, stabbing needles into Sebastian, bringing him to his knees. The figures and Jordan watch in disbelief as the staff of Meadowbrook Asylum overpower their headmaster. No matter how hard he tries to fight them off, the drugs are now taking effect. Sebastian falls to the ground, coughing, looking at his staff weakly, saying between coughs, you can't kill me. I'll be up soon, and when I do, 
I will end you all. A doctor comes from the group, staring at Sebastian's burnt, pale face. He points to Jordan. The words from Dr. Irving come to Jordan's mind that he can kill him. He takes the scalpel from his pocket he stole from the office, shuffling to Sebastian. Two doctors tackle Sebastian, restraining him. Gently, Jordan rubs the blade across the madman's neck. In a weak tone, Sebastian replies, laughing. (laughs) Go ahead, do it. Jordan stares into Sebastian's soulless eyes, whispering to him. You told me once, you're what makes hell here. Well, you aren't anymore. Let me show you what hell really feels like. He slices the scalpel across Sebastian's neck, swiftly causing him to fall to the ground. Blood squirts as the eyes from the headmaster turn lifeless. Jordan smiles, knowing Sebastian, the headmaster of Meadowbrook Asylum, is now dead. The staff stare at his motionless body, not knowing what to say. For the first time, everyone was free. Tears stream down their faces as the realization of freedom sets in. The doctor from the crowd approaches Sebastian. You... you've killed him. I can't believe it, he's dead. Jordan questions the man's statement. He's dead, right? This isn't a trick, is it? I've seen what he can do. The doctors nod with acknowledgement. Yes, let's finish this quickly then. He leads Jordan to the boiler room, signaling him to enter. The staff heads to each of the lost one's cells, opening them, freeing them. Smiles replace the flat expressions they once had. Jordan enters the boiler room with the doctor. A noise of working machinery fills the room. Ancient mechanisms fill the room, with steam exiting from each one. In a prominent tone, he asks, How do we destroy this room? The doctor stares at a wheezing gas pump, breaking off one of the pipes, creating a gas leak. At the corner of the room is a golden lighter. Jordan walks over to the lighter, igniting it, showing it could work. He holds the lighter, stepping to the other room, chattering to the staff. With this, I will free you from this place. I can destroy the boiler room and send you to the afterlife you deserve. If anyone doesn't want this, speak now. Everyone remains silent, giving the signal to destroy the asylum. Jordan approaches the pump, putting the lighter beside it, letting out a spark that creates a fire. The staff members rise, eyeing the fire. Some sit there, watching in awe as others open their arms and walk towards it. A faint blue essence exits each person as they touch the flame. Their bodies turn to ash, making the flame grow. Jordan could barely open his eyes as the flames approached him. He didn't know what would happen. Would the flames engulf him? Would he die? Would he come back to his physical body? He didn't know, but there was only one way to find out. He sits there, smiling, accepting his fate, throwing the lighter into the fire, destroying the asylum's purgatory, freeing the souls. Jordan coughs, awaking on the asylum's cold floor. He looks at it, recognizing its destroyed features. He was now back in his world. Struggling to his feet, Jordan leans against the room, yelling across the asylum. Jacob, where are you? He receives no answer, making him nervous. Jordan's vision adjusts to the dark, seeing Jacob looking at the wall where the portraits were. Except this time, they're gone. The gruesome images were gone. The figures were no longer in the room. Jacob turns to Jordan, 
A sense of calm comes through his voice. Well, you did it, kid. Whoever was there can now rest in peace. Jordan rises to his feet, matching the gaze of Jacob, confused. So, what happens now? Jacob breathes as tears start to form. Honestly, I don't know. I brought you here to destroy the portrait world, and you've done what I asked. Did you find out what happened to your friend? Jordan puts his head down, staying quiet. Jacob drags himself over to Jordan, patting his back. I'm sorry, but there's nothing you could have done. His sacrifice wasn't in vain. What do you mean? Jordan asks. Replying in a graceful tone, Jacob points to all corners of the room. The figures you saw before you entered the portrait world disappeared. When you destroyed the asylum's purgatory, they disappeared, rescuing them from their prison. Without Sebastian or the asylum, no one can control them, meaning they're now free, and they can finally rest in peace. Jordan smiles at the comments. Now that it's over, what will you do? Jacob lowers his head, downhearted. Well, there's only one thing I can do from now on. I need to destroy this place. There are still people who know what happened here. This place doesn't deserve to live. He stares out the window, putting his hand against it. Well, I've done many things I'll have to answer for when I die. But there's still one thing I can do to redeem myself. While you were in the portrait world, the figures helped me lace the place with gasoline. I'm going to burn Meadowbrook to the ground. It's time for me and the Asylum to join Sebastian. Jordan turns to the exit before looking at Jacob one final time. Thank you. I could have never have done this without you. With those final words, he exits the Asylum, watching the sight of orange flames grow. He walks away, knowing it's over. Jordan's friends may be gone, but he knew one thing for sure. Meadowbrook Asylum is gone, and the souls that were damned could finally rest. <laughs>